now that we're starting, uh, just want to, a lot of you people are here for the first time. Uh, this is the fourth pr uh, product loop meetup. Um, so I think it's in order to explain uh, why the world needs and the world needs this meetup or another meetup on building digital products. Um, I think there are plenty of gurus, authors, and master classes on on how to do product right. Uh, still, I am yet to find one single person who is satisfied with how they're doing product in their current job on their current organization. Even when I've taught or talked to people working in, in the right places like Google or Spotify, they still don't like it, uh, like how they work right now. So I, I really haven't found anybody who's satisfied. Um, they all and I also uh, strive toward working in this product nirvana uh, that I've come to the conclusion that I don't really think it exists uh, where we're doing everything perfectly as prescribed by the book. Um, and doing it in organizations molded exactly around the textbook version, that's kind of the requirement. Uh, and that world just doesn't exist either. Uh, all companies are different. Uh, the world doesn't always revolve around product. And that's kind of the theme today as well. Um, and when I've attended master classes of some of the bigger authors within product and UX, they don't really give an alternative do it to doing it by the book. It's either or. So if your organization is not doing it by the book, it's suddenly a toxic environment. And when it's tox a toxic environment, it becomes uh, easy to point fingers at everyone else but yourself. So I'm missing a debate about what you uh, can do as an individual contributor, as a team, not what other people around you should do for you. I'm lacking a discussion about being pragmatic, about getting things done, about getting things to work. Uh, so I'm, I'm a bit tired of this dogmatic approach to doing product. Just, I just want to do good work. So I believe it's time for us product people to make it work in the situation that we are in right now uh, and not keep on dreaming about what it could be because then we'll never change. Uh, I think it's time to take action and be more pragmatic. So I'm interested in exploring the more um, intricate subject of how we actually make it work, how we do it right, how we work well together, make the things the book write about happen in real life. So, you know, we have all read the books many times. We are all believers, yet none of us has tried to work in that end goal product nirvana environment described by the books. So I would like to level the bar so we can start having a discussion about where we are now and where we go from here, where we are right now. I'd lo like to go beyond the books, uh, beyond this dogma sold to us by product groups, probably so they can sell more books. I think it's time to go into practice. And so that's why uh, the Product Loop Meetup was born, uh, to, to fill that void. Um, today's topic is, uh, is uh, presenting your work and articulating your decisions and having an impact. Um, so we'll spend this evening looking at the world from the perspective of designers. So what you'll experience today is uh, three seasoned product people who've spent years struggling on getting things to work. And they all at some point took time out to reflect on what it takes to make an impact with their work. Um, and that most often involves engaging other people than themselves. So tonight they each bring their own perspective, but I believe that they probably all agree with, with each other uh, in, in, in what they each bring. Um, but what is interesting is that uh, how they tackle it uh, is from different angles. So today's topic is presenting and articulating design decisions. Uh, so welcome. And so why am I doing this? Um, so now is the plug and uh, this is, uh, bear with me, but this is uh, what I'm doing for, uh, for my full-time work. I started a mentor platform for product and UX people uh, in November uh, last year. Um, it's a uh, it's a mentor platform where you can learn more about uh, just being a, a product person. Uh, and I don't think you can read it all in the books. I think you sometimes need to lean on other people, especially uh, when you're not dogmatic and, and not doing it as prescribed by the book. Then it can be a bit overwhelming uh, to make decisions uh, because like, if you don't have the book to lean on, then who should you lean on? And so there are other people to help you. So it's a community for those of you who would like somebody to lean on and support you on your journey as you're trying to make an impact with your work.
It's a platform where members can book one-on-one -on -one video, video calls with uh, experienced product people uh, to get qualified sparring and help from others who have been in the same situation as you are in right now. Um, they can help point you in the right direction and provide confidence in taking that leap of faith that sometimes requires to grow out of your comfort zone. And I believe this one-on-one uh, -on -one format for mentoring and active learning is, is way more powerful than Facebook groups, master classes, or an infinite number of Medium articles. Um, I've been through that myself, uh, especially when it's about moving already experienced people like yourselves who have already got the fundamentals in place. All right, so, so that's about product people, uh, learning loop. Um, these are some of the great mentors on there. Um, it's, it's a platform where you need to have a job within the industry, so you need to apply uh, and, I, uh, and also write a motivation. So that's uh, to make it worthwhile for, um, for the mentors. Uh, so they are also they are doing it on a volunteer basis, uh, and it's nice to, to have somebody who actually know what they're talking about. So just being here is a great qualifier. So if you're interested in, in, in having somebody to lean on in your day-to-day -day work, uh, sign up uh, at learningloop.io. All right, so today's uh, menu is uh, is quite great. I'm I'm very happy about this. Um, so let me just briefly uh, present them. So um, if you start with Joachim, uh, I first met Joachim when uh, he was interning as a print designer, actually, at a, a, a male lifestyle print magazine at a company that we are both working on. And I was acting as the head of digital. Um, and I'm just super happy that we convinced Joachim to spend time on our digital platforms as, as well. And I later brought him on as a full-time uh, UX designer, I, I believe it, as your first uh, UX or design uh, job out of school. Um, yeah. And we parted uh, worlds after a few years, uh, after a lot of beers as well, <laughs> um, and a lot of fun. Uh, and since then, uh, Joachim has just been taking off. Uh, and it's been a true pleasure seeing Joachim uh, uh, just go from one thing to the other, uh, bigger and bigger in his career. Uh, I believe he's one of Denmark's only design influencers as well. If if you, uh, uh, he's got some really good tips on Instagram on like just dissect cool stuff online uh, or in, in the real world and say, uh, yeah, why is this good and so forth. So if you need somebody to follow on Instagram, um, find him. Um, but he actually also works on quite cool products at Lego. Um, Joachim has taught designers about pitching their ideas as well, uh, and, and tonight uh, he'll boil down uh, this course he has, uh, a longer workshop, and give his best golden nuggets of advice for you today. So a little bit long in introduction, but uh, he could take it. Now, David, um, actually, the weird, I have a history with all of you. Uh, I, I met David back in Munich in 2005 at the PUSH conference. Uh, I was, uh, I have this... Uh, persuasive pattern card deck a brainstorming tool that I published in 2015. Um, and David was in my my, my uh, master class there where I, I was actually just testing it. So he's got this uh, beta deck, uh, like first of his kind. Uh, I, th I think you've got one of the only ones uh, still left. Um, and since then, David became a UX coach, helping companies get their design and research process right. Uh, so not an agile coach, but a UX coach. I just love that. Uh, and it turns out our path actually crossed again uh, as uh, I found out he was actually uh, helping a mutual client staff base back in 2020. I'm happy to see some staff bases uh, here as well. Uh, so welcome. I'm ha super happy to have David be part of this evening's meetup. Um, and I know that he shares this pragmatic agenda of getting things to work and has made it work for a large number of clients. Now, finally, Tom. Um, Tom and I uh, also met at the PUSH conference a year later in 2016. Um, I have no clue why they invited me back to speak, but uh, they did. And I'm happy to have met uh, Tom there. Um, I enjoyed uh, Tom's talk and I remember just nodding down on my notepad that I needed to, to uh, follow him and uh, I needed to hear him speak again. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get the chance, but then, you know, why not just ask him to speak, right? And uh, <laughs> so uh, after a while, Tom said yes, and I'm so, super stoked. Um, so back in 2016, Tom had just published his book on, on articulating design decisions. Um, and I think, you know, the book has taken uh, its, the, its a life of its own. It's sold in over 35,000, 36,000 copies, uh, translated into seven languages. 
uh, is a best-selling US book on, on Amazon. Uh, so I, I really believe Tom is a guarantee for lots of aha moments uh, and, and a good pragmatic wake-up call actually for doing things differently. So welcome all, all three and welcome to all of you. So let's get started. Um, the first speaker is, oh no. Yeah, let's just do a quick poll actually. So also just for the speakers to, um, uh, to get a sense of who we are, uh, who's in the crowd and, and, and uh, what we're dealing with. So if you could just actually just write in the comments, um, what is your biggest challenge right now in regards to presenting your work and articulating design decisions, you know, and having uh, your, your work have impact, your design work have impact. So just let's just take 30, uh, 40 seconds. Uh, just write whatever thing uh, com comes to mind in, in the comments and I'll try to read them up. Just to kind of level the bar and see where we're at and what we're dealing with. Take it away. Nothing really. So, so including there it comes perfect. Including data-driven design decisions and presenting that interesting. Yeah, and Laura is telling a story, articulating my design decisions, following a structure so it's easier for the audience to understand. So stepping in the other's shoes, storytelling, telling a story. All right. Yeah, compiling and presenting the. Tremendous amount of UX research that led to uh, lead to design decisions in a simple way. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, audience with different design maturity, feeling confident in my decisions enough to stand up for them despite being a more junior level than my peers. And then hitting the right level of detail for a given audience. Something about you know have, not having enough confidence and in your abilities. Um, Enhancing the UX point of view to non UXers, moving from management got, got feelings toward data driven. All right, perfect. I think that's that's good for now. Um, I think that gives us a, a pretty good idea of, of where we're starting from. So um, the first speaker is uh, is Joachim. So uh, and he'll talk about how to best present your work. And I suggest that if you have any questions during Joachim's talk then write them in the chat and we'll take them in the Q&A session immediately after the talk, right? So, uh, so then we can have a steady flow. So um, Joachim, take it away, just uh, take my screen. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having me. I'll see you. Thank you works. for coming. Great, I guess you can see my, my screen now. Yes, perfectly. Um, so uh, my name is Joachim and I'm a senior digital product designer as, at Lego right now. Um, and uh, I'm here to tell you a little about my recipe for standing stronger when you're presenting your ideas. Um, uh, yeah, um, I have used AI to generate all the images in my presentation. So something might look funny, but I guess they got the hairline right. Um, but let me just get started here. Um, so on a note to your introduction, uh, Anas, um, I think that, um, or I believe that for, for products and the way that we are changing things as well, um, it, it's fair to say that designers, at least uh, in my experience right now, is probably doing 50% product and 50% stakeholder management or presenting and, trying to articulate that. Um, so that's what I will try to give my take on today. So I have more than 10 years of experience presenting both good and bad uh, presentations in the <laughs> private sector and in the, awesome. in the public se uh, sector as well. And uh, I experienced a lot of different things. Sometimes it's, you know, reactions like this that goes to your presentation, people really don't care, or <laughs> why is he saying that? He says that all the time. Um, 
thank you for the laugh because it makes me feel the crowd. It, it, thank you for that. It could also be reactions like this. Uh, so it basically becomes this kind of argument across the room, assumption against assumption. Um, the designer likes the button to be green based on some uh, evidence or something. And then uh, some stakeholder out of nowhere just has opinions on like another opinion. And how do, how do you deal with that? So I have a lot of these kind of slides. I call them power slides. It's basically nuggets for for you to put down in your pocket. Um, and I will share them afterwards as well uh, on LinkedIn. There's a lot of these. So everybody has opinions on design. That's just how it is. Um, so I will start this presentation with a little storytelling. Like Anna said, I, I tend to go in to come with examples from the real world or something that is totally not in the area that we work in uh, and try to make, make it more tangible that way. So in 2010, I worked in this electronic store. Uh, that, that's not 50 cent, it's just a cardboard. Um, and uh, I saw myself as this you know, sleek sales type that could uh, sell everything to everyone, right? And then um, there was, like this is the typical scene actually, there was a customer coming in, maybe with a wish to buy an iPad, and I find myself trying to, well, do you want a bag as well? And they say no. Do you want this service deal where we can, you know, we can install it for you, like installing an iPad, right? Um, and they said no. So how did I, how do I deal with that? I even, you know, made jokes, and this is basically a Danish joke, but I, I said that you, you, you need insurance, right? Because it's a tablet, and tablet in, in Danish is uh, dropped easily, right? So, but it, no matter what, it didn't work. I was the only one laughing at my jokes. And um, I found myself trying to sell, like eager to, well, this insurance is really good because it can do this and this and this, and it, like, it was already too late at that point. Um, and they left. So assumptions really don't get you anywhere. And that's, that's when I learned this kind of, uh, inside and you hear that like everywhere now in the ux area that assumptions is the the worst thing uh, to uh, to have in a meeting so so there is a good connection to our ux process and the double diamond even uh, in this presentation but i will not talk about that so i try, try to change directions a little bit i try to lean back and listen a little bit, just small talk with the customer. And um, I found that the customer really liked that and talked back and there was no product involved. It was just, so why are you here? Well, ah, I you know, spilled tea in my laptop and I need, need a new one. And uh, oh, okay, well, what do you do for a living? And so just talking back and forth. But obviously while talking back and forth, I, in my mind had, all the products on the shelves and try to match them up with what I could see uh, and uh, she was saying. So after two minutes of small talk, I know that she's a freelance graphic designer using Adobe Creative Suite. This is 2010. She needs a powerful computer to run this. That inside one, right? She's not very tech savvy, but her brother helps uh, when he is visiting from Sweden. Well, maybe we shouldn't bother uh, her brother every time there's a problem with uh, something with the tech. Uh, we could help with that, right? We have a service deal. Um, she's often on the move, move, going out to clients to present. So she probably need a bag as well, right? She probably need like external hard drive. All of that jazz. She likes to take photos using her phone, again, 2010. The camera on the phone is not, not that good. And she, she probably might want to use this for professional stuff, right? So we could probably sell her a camera, a DSLR or something. And back to that as well, because she's on the move, right? And again, she spilled tea in her previous laptop and lost all her data. So based on this insight, I can sell her, right? 
we just had the small talk. She already trust me. You told me that you had an accident with your T with your previous laptop, and that it's important to you because of your work. I want to mention our insurance is only two euro each month, month uh, which is cheaper than your cup of tea. It covers pretty much all damages, including liquids. There's no own risk. And if it can't be repaired, you will get a new one for the same price as the one you bought it for. Um, that way, you never have to worry about accidents. And you know that you will always have a computer powerful enough for your freelance work. We'll get that back to this. But just to prove my point that just two minutes small talk can come a long way. And also, this is from you know from one of the analysis cards from the persuasive design stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> it's hard for people to argue against their own words, right? Um, which is the commitment bias here. So they, she already said she spilled tea in the, her computer. She can't deny that. So she can't say it's a bad idea to have an insurance because she can't say it will not have it again. Okay. So this is my 3P recipe. Maybe that's four Ps. Um, the first one is plan, prepare, and present. Note this down. Take a screenshot. Watch the video afterwards. We'll start with plan. So imagine you are in a, a courtroom, basically. You are preparing the closing arg arguments. Um, I want you to imagine to plan for that, basically. That's what I have in my head. I want to imagine what out outcome am I aiming for, basically. Um, you always see this in the lawyer attorney TV shows, right? Well, the, the opponent will probably go this way. We should go this way, right? You should try to figure that out before. What objections might come up? What might people say and nudge for? There's always this stakeholder nudging for something specific, like pet peeve of some, you know, they're measured on for getting a bonus, right? And what evidence do you need to back up your, uh, your idea? Prepare. So gather evidence. And what is evidence? Why isn't this just called research, right? It could be called research, but I don't want to mingle this term with what we know as research, what we know as user research. But obviously, all those kind of things is part of evidence. Evidence is user research, user needs, business needs, what problems we have to solve, the target group, data, budget, KPIs. It can be bad things, it can be good things. But there are also another side of evidence. It could be the small talk. I just um, showed you an example of. So what people said, it could be what uh, a stakeholder said a few years, uh, not years, weeks back at a Friday bar, an opinion of some direction for the product. That's not, you know, it could be something uh, like that. It could be like uh, one of the cognitive biases. It could be observations. Uh, I noticed that none of uh, the colleagues in the office take fruit, fruit, the fruit from the fruit basket. That's evidence. They don't do it, the fruit is still there. We don't know why, but it's still evidence, right? So if somebody comes with an assumption, everybody loves the fruit. No, I've actually seen that the fruit is still there every day. So that's evidence trumping over um, the assumption, right? It could also be limitations. And again, what we know and don't know. So evidence eats assumptions for breakfast, even the smallest piece of evidence. And it's even stronger when it doesn't come from you. So even though you have an opinion and expertise in the field, that you could share, it's even better if it's something you observe, like um, somebody actually mentioned to me, it shouldn't be a lie, obviously, that people don't take the fruit. It's somebody else's observation, right? Because then it's, I don't know why, it's more tr trustworthy or something, right? Um, and, you know, don't turn your evidence into assumptions. Like the evidence here is not that 
nobody eats the fruit, right? Because that's an assumption. The evidence here is I've noticed for a week that there has been a lot of fruit in the basket still. Presenting. So there are many ways to present. I've tried them all, not in a like in a strategic, structured way. I just try to brainstorm what kind of different ways to present have I actually done and what have worked. And I, I try to give them some kind of names here. So these are the uh, pitch pitchfalls or pitchfalls. Um, the first one is the six-year-old. So that's basically, I made it wrong about my uh, thumb. Here's how it looks, right? Showing the design right away. Really eager to show, I work on this all week, man. It's, it's so cool. Everybody will love this. The second one is the eager one. A kind of similar. But we all know these kind of meetings, brainstorms, where we discuss, the, oh, there's this problem. And then solutions start popping up, right? I think we should do this because this and this and this, this. Well, you can't do that because that, 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 that. And it's assumptions or basically, yeah. It's discussions, right? Yeah, the bedtime story. This is uh, usually the the new designer trying to prove that I can do it in the right way, showing the whole process I did. Nobody does the process by the book, right? You said that on us. They wish to maybe, but it's a direction, I guess. Nobody wants to see your process. Everybody wants to see the result of the process. Right? Don't get them bored because before they see the design. And also, also, here we ask for feedback. Why don't you trust your work to be good enough? So you kind of. So what do you think? It's up for grabs. Do you like red better? We can do that. Right. Then there's the first time, and only talking about the analysis and the research and stuff, and then having a little time for the design. I've tried this in the agency that basically did analysis. Uh, so I was icing on the cake. Uh, and that was really hard to you know, take up from there. And then the second diamond. Oh, we have this problem. I solved it here, right? So wait with your ideas. That's basically the, the main takeaway I want you to take away from this. Start with the evidence. So this is the recipe I would suggest or that I use. Start with the evidence, present your idea using E, F, A, B. I will come back to that and wrap it up. It doesn't say feedback. I will also come back to that. So again, to the courtroom with the weird hand. Start, uh, share the evidence that complements your idea. Obviously, we don't want people to, you know, we don't want you to share everything you know, right? There's no reason. It can be too long and people are just don't want to hear. Five slides smacks about just to get you back to speed. Here's the slides you need to know about. That's why this is what I saw for based on what I know. Um, so why do we start with uh, the evidence? You limit the amount of objections to handle, right? In the plan uh, phase, you try to come up with, so what might people object for? I come with an objection, that not, that's not true because this and this and this and this. Well, then we should try to come uh, find evidence that proves this right, right? So we already talked about the evidence. So why would people object to that? And if they do object, it's probably something you forgot or it's a valid objection, right? Your deal will not be based on assumptions. Objections and new ideas will be based on the evidence shared, making the discussion and ideas valid and productive. So I shared this, all this information with you. Here's my idea. And then people will start commenting on that and say, well, that's good. But what if, what if we did this and they, they include the knowledge you just shared? So their ideas becomes just as good as yours. This is not a competition about the best ideas, right? Um, who has the best ideas? It's about coming up with the best ideas together. And then also, 
you can reference back to the shared evidence when explaining the concept and idea, or when argumenting against objections. Well, a stakeholder comes with it. I think we should do this. Yes, but I just showed you that evidence showed this. And well, for that, it probably has to be some bigger evidence that I noticed some fruit thing, right? Repeat the evidence, research, insights, resume, all that from last meeting, even if they already know. We had this workshop on Friday. Everybody was really into it. Well, take the summary from those slides that complements your idea and share them as the first thing in the presentation, even if they already know. It's a good way to put everybody up to the same you know, knowledge baseline of what you're trying to present. Don't assume what they know. Again, share your results from the process instead of the process. So when you have your um, evidence, try to um, match your evidence with, so what do we know, the kind of evidence, and what will do, what we will do about it in this idea, right? I'll come with some examples. This is not an example. This is an example of something else. So imagine a, a suitcase. Usually what we do is we describe the features. So this is a suitcase. Um, it's so big and it has this kind of capacity. There are the advantages. You can take it with you as hand, lug hand luggage because of the size. But what we usually forget is to talk about the benefit. You don't have to use your vacation waiting in long lines at the luggage belt. And you are sure your things will not get lost. That is the benefit. So we need to talk about the benefits from your idea rather than the features and the advantages. It doesn't mean we shouldn't mention the feature, features and advantages, but we usually stop at the advantages, right? So this is the model for the EFAP, EFAP. Um, and this model is something you use for every idea. So if you're sharing a whole a website or a landing page, there are multiple ideas on that. Then you go around in this for every idea. You just shared the evidence for the whole page. When you do this, you reference back to that evidence. So I just told you, la, 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 feature, advantages, benefit. <clears throat> I will show you a brief of a case I had uh, some years back. The brief was create a better waiting experience for our users waiting in our digital queue. The queue was huge. Uh, most of Denmark looked at it at the same time. Um, some of the limitations was that we can't remove the queue uh, and we cannot make it shorter. And you can only change, we can only change HTML and CSS. Like that creates a, a, a normal technical limitation in terms of, oh, we can do a lot of cool stuff. Well, not actually. So, I tried to dig into what does waiting mean? How do people experience waiting? And I came up with a, a lot of insights. And I, this is two of them, just to show one of the ideas. Um, so unexplained cues feels longer than explained cues, right? So you are on this phone call with your insurance company. Thank you for waiting. Please hold. They won't tell you what number you are in the queue, right? It feels a lot longer than knowing that you're number 15 in the queue. Am I 15 and not five? Am I 30, right? We don't want to know there is an effort made for it to be uh, my turn in the queue. Um, Apple, when you call their self-service desk, I think it's called, they have these, added these, you know, uh, typing, sounds so it sounds like oh people are really busy I, I have patience i can wait also just for that 
Um, so to solve for the unexplained queues, uh, we want to create an understanding to why there is a queue and why it can be longer than expected. We want to, so in terms of the effort, we want to show progress of the queue. So we are not explaining how we will do it, more or less. We, yeah, I guess that's what we are explaining, but not what it is, right? That's the idea in the design. So this is what we have, what they had before that should be changed. There's a queue number. There is how many people are in front of you. There is what time do we expect you to get access and when that is. And then there is this bar. And this bar moves really slow. If there is a lot of users in here, it, it's, it stands still, right? So it doesn't really show the progress. People were like, um, a, 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 is this tab frozen now? And try to reboot the whole computer, in mostly old, elder, elderly people, um, because they're really just staring at this page, waiting to get access, not daring to do anything else. OK? So again, the evidence. This will be the presentation, more or less, for, for the client, right? We know that the unexplained queues feel longer than ex, uh, unexplained queues feel longer than explained queues. We also know that users want to see progress in the queue. And we also know there are limited technical possibilities and budget. The idea is to visualize the queue in an animated GIF. The GIF zooms in on the front of the queue, showing how many people get in every second. Because right now we are in the back and we imagine you're at a concert, you know, at a queue to a concert or uh, some kind of festival, it stands still, right? But if you zoom in at the front, everybody is running in. And that's the image we want to give people. So this is the solution. The advantage with, the advantage with this um, GIF is that that way we can show both progress and get understanding of the queue. The GIF is both, both cheap and fast to make and has no technical complexity. The benefits is, I believe users will be more comfortable seeing progress of the queue on the website. There will also be more understanding towards why it takes so long when seeing all of these people, like 1,212, 1, getting in the tiny little door in one straight line. Um, four people at a second. We made this GIF with the same duration as last year, how many people got in every second. So it is actually the right speed, you would say. So that's one example. And I don't know if you noticed, but another example is this. So I started with the evidence. Then I mentioned the feature, the, the insurance, the advantage of what it covers, and uh, there's no risk, um, and the benefit that she doesn't have to worry. So wrapping up your presentation, what do you think? Never do that. Do you have any questions? Right? This is your work. This is the design being presented. If there's any objections or changes, they will come. People will say it. If there's something that doesn't match or bothers them, they will say it. You don't have to ask for it. If you ask for a specific, any changes you would want to make, the assumptions come riding in. All right? And so this is wrapping up. Assumptions. Don't get you anywhere. Plan your presentation. Watch out for pitchfalls and start with evidence. Thank you. And I will share all these uh, colorful slides on LinkedIn uh, later. Awesome. Thank you so much. So if uh, we can just put our sound on, just give uh, Joachim a little bit of applause here. Thank you so much. So if you have any questions, um, please write them in, in the chat. Um, if uh, I'll, I'll just start out while, while you're typing. Um, so, so Joachim, I, I love your recipe uh, for showing evidence first. Um, 
Okay, I, I guess some designers live in this situation where they don't feel they have time to produce the evidence. So yeah. what's your advice to them? That's actually a good point because this can look like a lot of work, but this method is also something you can use, you know, uh, around the coffee machine. When somebody is saying an issue with stuff, start with, um, well, we know that this and this and this, or, well, we actually don't know if this and this, so maybe we should just start with the low hanging fruit of that, mm -hmm. right? So, so it doesn't have to be a presentation. It could also be used. Um, I use it when I um, wrote my uh, application for this job or other jobs as well. In there, the evidence is in the, the job description and also in the company values and all that. Using the same words, tapping into to the words they use and the phrases they use. Um, yeah. So, um, and if you're a designer, and I think a lot of designers are actually put in a situation where they see themselves doing, you know, only UI work and, and, and a lot of struggle to do, to you know, just be able to do research, right? And that's, uh, that's, you know, what they spend time convincing their boss about, you know, why don't we do research? So, yeah. so if, if you are in that situation, like, how can you get to a point uh, where you can do the stuff that you're talking about? I guess sometimes with colors, uh, unless we use color psychology and that's your evidence, it's mm. sometimes a hunch, right? I saw this trend, it looks pretty, I'm gonna use that. Um, mm. I haven't defined so many brand identities because they're usually already put in place. So I just mm. activated those, right? Um, but I think that, you, you know, if there must be something that drives you to the conclusion of a specific color or a specific placement or mm. um, and try to tap into that even if the evidence is I saw that on this page and this page and this page they do it and it works well mm. it's still more evidence than an assumption that well I think it should be elsewhere with no reason mm. but obviously so, it dive uh, into best practices and and all that sure there is different degrees of evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Some is stronger than other. And uh, yeah, and I guess it's you know about finding the evidence that you you have available, and you'll probably always have some evidence available, right? And then you start from there, just present it like that. So, any other question? Uh, any other questions? And please write them in the chat. I'm I'm waiting. I've got one more question lined up uh, myself, but I'd I'd rather have your questions. So, please type them in. Please type them in, and then uh, while you're doing that, um, I'll just I'll just uh, ask another question. So uh, some of these golden nuggets that you you mentioned are, I think, closely aligned with the jobs to be done framework. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I haven't worked so much with it, but I'm familiar. So you know this thing about you know uh, it's not just the features, it's not uh, about the advantages, uh, but I think what you mentioned as the uh, the benefits. You know, what yeah. jobs do we hire this thing to do? Yeah. Um, yes. So do you see the, that connecting? I definitely uh, see that connecting. connecting. Yeah. And I also see this connecting in, in, again, the double diamond and the UX process, right? You know, use the research, yeah. but also share your research when presenting it, right? Uh, to make good products or to get, make good presentations. It's the same yeah. thing with assumptions. We can't as assume something for a product just as we can't assume something for an idea uh, in the presentation or how we assume people will take it. But I, I guess evidence in your book can be both the first and, and second diamond, uh, diamond, right? So both problems and like both the generative evidence and the evaluative. Yeah, yeah. For me, I think it's it's just for this example, it's it's to stand stronger. So some mm. evidence is better than no evidence at all, and obviously, yeah. better evidence is better than the, the yeah, you know yeah. simple evidence right um, yeah all also so uh anything any uh, last things you want to say i don't think we, we're gonna we can get any uh, it was so perfect uh <laughs> that there's there aren't that many questions um do you have any any last notes uh Joachim? any reflections you want to add uh, uh no nothing other than you know this is just something 
just keep the thing in mind with sh start with evidence and plan ahead so if you know that this could be an example with your kid right if you know that your kid uh, hates to do uh, x right and needs to be prepared for something and like plan in advance that well you actually said yesterday that you would like to do this today because you didn't want to do it yesterday okay mm -hmm. i know then i'll do it now now right because they already made the deal yesterday about you know cleaning their room i don't want to do it today i'll do it tomorrow okay then tomorrow i'll ask again and then he will do it yeah 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 i i know that i i can relate with my kids <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you so much Joachim. um <laughs> then, uh, i think it is time for our next speaker so um let's just see here if you can get me so the next speaker is is david i already gave a uh, i think quite thorough uh, introduction to david so i think david is now it's, it's it's just your moment to shine david's take is uh is, is to start pitch and maybe start collaborating so maybe a different approach maybe not let's let's see david uh take it away If you are there. Are you all right, David? David, are you ready? So now I'm back at home network issues. Oh, perfect timing. For some reason awesome. it tends to uh, reconnect at uh, no, no. Awesome. But okay, cool. You're with us now. Let's just take it away. Yeah. I'm with you now, and you should also see my screen, right? Yes, it's perfect, thanks. Perfect. So in case you wonder, I have all of you in the screen underneath, so I will look probably quite often underneath. Mm -hmm. And I have also you visible, that's perfect. Nice, okay, then thanks for the introduction, Anders. My name is David, and I am the co-founder of Exactly. We help our clients to build and set up product design processes that actually works. Along the way, we present, we provide all the UX concepts as well as your UI designs and design systems. And to get you in the right mood, I would like to play with a small game. It's an easy one. It's just hands up, hands down. And in order to join the game, you can just use your video camera, or you can also use, at the bottom of the Google stream, this hand icon. Let's test it quickly. Nice, it works perfectly. OK, then. The rules are quite easy. At the beginning of the game, we all have our hands raised. So hands up, please. Nice, that works so good. Okay, then let's start with the game. And every time when you ask, when you answer a question with a no, you will just lower your hand and keep it there until the end of the game. Okay, check. Then let's start. First question. Who of you were already in a pitch situation where you needed to present your outcome to stakeholders, to someone else, in order to progress to the next step? Okay, cool. Nice, right audience for today. Next question, is pitching a mandatory thing in your product organization? So is this something you need to do on a regular basis? Still hands up, great. Oh, one hands down. Okay, next one. Who of you believes that pitching adds value to your product processes? Okay, let's see. Still a lot of fans oh. up. And last question. Who of you actually enjoys to pitch? Nice. Okay, um, I'm curious to talk with all of you uh, who have still the hands up. To be honest, I'm not in favor of pitching. And there are different reasons why it is this way and I will discuss today my learnings about the last two decades, 20 years, 
and the reasoning why I really hate pitching in a product environment. Let's start the talk. What I've observed over the last 20 years or so is in our pitches, we had really, really fancy slides. We had a great outcome. The vision was on point. Everything was going the right way. Oh, I see the, yeah, you know what comes next. Okay, after the pitch, everything starts to fall apart. And you always have some discussions here and there. Saying it starts to fall apart. You have recurring discussions. It's to explain things again and again. And every time you need to make changes on the product. So it will look slightly different until the release day. And then you may wonder, oh, this is actually what I have pitched. I mean, it looks more like the evil twin and not what I wanted to have. And this is something I still experience until today. And I started to wonder why. Why? I mean, we did everything right. We did the right pitch. In our presentation, everything was right. We had the customer's journeys. We had the research. We had the pain points. We had the jobs to be done. Personas, fancy mockups, perfect user flows. Everything was right. And I think part of it is because of the pitch situation. And I want to present today my idea about it and what I think is the urge of this behavior. We will start with a small introduction about the nature of pitch, what the pitch actually is. And then we go to the so-called false positives. And at the end, I would maybe give you a little bit of inspiration how a UX process, UX product process could look like for you with which you can just start to implement straight from today, which is especially helpful when your UX maturity of your company isn't as high or you have a lot of unsecureness in between. Let's start. No worries, I don't want to go to my CV at this point. The only important part in this CV is quite in the middle. This marks the part where I made a transition from an art director to a design manager. And to be honest, at this point, I had seriously no clue about design management. I just get the position and was there responsible for a lot of people. And I did the natural thing. I just tried to read everything what I could about design management, people culture, design ops, UX strategy, design thinking, workshop facilitation, and UX research. And eventually, I continued this learning habit and also founded UXactly 2016 and left my safe permanent position to see the world and to see how others do this, how other companies act and other team works. Still, I need to admit, I need still to pitch. But everything, every time when I pitch, something feels just wrong. Just last year, we had a bigger pitch for a German, German car maker. And we were booked for part of the product process, which were all about delivering assets for the development team to actually develop it, which means we provided the research, the UX concepts, and even the UI mockups and the vision visuals, vision concept visuals. And several months later, we, uh, the company was so nice and presented the outcome to us. And it was not quite there. It looks still like the evil twin from what we wanted to build, actually. So in the last 10 years, I figured out that part of the problem could be the pitch situation itself. And to give you a little bit more introduction why I think it is like it is, like it is, is let us just check out the pitch situation. In the pitch situation, it's mostly you pitching something to others, right? And you all have something to do. You're all busy. You're all in the hamster wheel. It's you, the others. But you need to present your 100 slides, right? 100 slides in 30 minutes. Go. 
Then you start to present them, go through them. But in reality, all the others in the room were also quite busy. And they have something like a social contract, which means if they say no to your pitch, they will lose a lot of time and need to pit, look on the pitch again and again until it fits. So they say mostly, yes, just do it. And the problem here is really in a pitch situation, it's a one directional communication. But what you really want to have, whoops, one directional, you communicate with the others, towards the others, but also an opportunity to come back to you because time is limited. But what you really want to have instead, you want to have a bi-directional communication or let's say a conversation where you try to get all the insights from the people in the room and share your knowledge with them so that you get a better understanding about the actual situation, their needs, the individual challenges, their pain points, their gains, all the things they would like to see here. So I personally, I try to avoid pitching in total when I try to set up product processes in other companies. Or well, let's take it a little bit more edgy. In the end, a pitch is like a hostage. You try to persuade the people until they say yes. For a rule of thumb, everyone says yes if you annoy them enough. Which leads us to the so-called false positives. I mean, you are in the pitch and you get some great feedback. The people start to love what you've created, starts to love what your team have created and all the thumbs are up, everything looks fine. But in reality, you missed a lot of opportunities to, dump, to do something more valuable. You missed the opportunity to learn and you lose lots the opportunity to just gather insights and have real conversations. In the end, to be honest, I get booked quite often just for part of the process. And in some situations, I already see that something is burning straight after the pitch, but I'm out in a lot of cases. Even if I start to communicate and start to convince them, hey, we can do the pitch, but it would be better to have us in the whole process so that we can communicate with all the necessary people to build the final product so that you don't lose any information. Sadly, the world is not perfect, and problems mostly start to emerge after a pitch or after handover. If we look on this simplified version of a product organization, then we have the different departments. It's mostly something like the business slash sales department, the product department, and the dev department. And all of them have their own rules like their own processes, their own cultures, their own structures, or, and their own unspoken rules. All the information are there in this department. It's really hard to get them out. When we are honest, that's our islands, or so-called silos. And nature of an island is, uh, the nature of islands is, in order to get from A to B, you need to book a ship, have everything in what you have in this small area, the small ship, and try to move it to the next island, which will probably mean that you will lose a lot of information along the line. Rule of thumb here is that you lose approximately 50% of information by end up, which means already in the small example, you will have, when the development starts, just 25% of the information you originally had from the beginning. And it gets even less, which is just shocking. Which means you lost just 75% of information, which will lead to more, more questions and questions and questions over and over again. In some cases, you may even answer the same questions over again and will change a lot along the process, which wouldn't be necessary. what you really want to have. What you really want to have is a continuous development loop, which enables you to move faster and faster over time, which enables you to learn from each other and to build trust over time. 
it's really about speed. You want to build up more speed and trust over time, and you want to eliminate all the friction along the way, which means that it's necessary. If you have, want to have a continuous implementation loop, you need to have all the people from the beginning to the end. It makes no sense to go from island to island. You want to have all your designers, your researchers, your devs, your PRs, your PMs, and at least one decision maker, this one is important, at least one decision maker in your process in order to go without any friction from A to Z. Bonus points when you add all your customer service. They have a lot of valuable insights for you. In conclusion, what you want to avoid are silos because you want to avoid the loss of data by handoff. You don't want to have any unnecessary friction and you don't want to require discussions. So having the same discussions over and over again. But what do you want to have? You want to have a common project understanding so everyone has the same understanding from start to end. So even if someone gets sick, even if you need to change some people, you have still all the inserts and information inside your team. You want to have a continuous duration loop and a high quality, which gets less when you lose information along the way. And in order to achieve this, what you really need is an autonomous team. So this is something I will not talk about today, but this is something we can talk about in the Q&A section or to a later point, you can just contact me. For today, you may wonder, okay, that sounds nice, but how? How should we change our processes? It's literally not possible. I mean, we did it always this way. And I don't know, I'm not sure if they trust me to just go through the whole process without any pitching or presenting. Problem is really, when you start to present your evidence, you present it to them. But instead, you could just discover it together which is mostly more helpful. Pitching is an sustainable approach for product processes as it adds more friction to the process, at least in my experience. So it can be as easy as starting to communicate more often. And this is something you can do right now, right? As complexity kills processes, you should really try to start small or like a bland stated it, without presentation, all that is left is communication, which means that you need to communicate as often and transparent as possible. And you can even start today with a self-experiment. You can just say to yourself, Dave, uh, actually your name is not Dave, I guess. I want to start my experiment today and I want to try it for 14 days to stop all the presentation and replace them instead with communication with real conversations. Just let it run for two weeks and see how it works out. And if you've done it, then the next step is probably to get your whole team on board. And what I want to show you right now is a possible process how it could look like, which is especially effective when you're just starting the whole Agile design journey to get your team onboarded and on speed. So phase one is bring everyone together, your whole team, which means from scratch, have the developers, the POs, the design, the researchers, all the possible gatekeepers and decision makers in one place, just to talk about the process you start to go with this artifact and discuss all the insights, goals, pains, gains, challenges, in short, the status quo, and try to get a common understanding about it. Important thing, it's not necessary that you have your whole team there, but you should have there all the people who are necessary for this feature or product you want to build. Going to the next step. The next step can be as easy as pen and paper. Don't make it too fancy. Try to keep it easy. Your designers will probably catch up quickly when you start to implement bigger design and more complex design processes, but for the beginning, start small. So pen and paper for the ideation phase. Let everyone write down, sketch out their ideas and present it to the group. 
and then gather all the insights to build something out of it together. And then after the sessions, after several days probably, you can just trust your product designer to iron out all the bumps and come up with a concept together with the developers, which then can, which then can go from A to B. Step three, as easy it can be, build, build and monitor. And the nice thing here is, as the developers were part of the whole process from the beginning, you do, don't need to waste time with complex or complicated handovers because they already know what you want to build because you designed it together with the whole team, which happens not, happens not so often, to be honest, but when it happens, it's really helpful and you see how your process will speed up over time. And the best thing is you avoid all the occurring discussions around specific topics. I think the product designers or concepts around you already, or POs, even POs, know this feeling. You have concepted something, you had some ideas, and afterwards you just give it to the developers and there are a lot of questions appearing and things start to get complicated until you have this evil twin. But in this case, keep it transparent, keep the information aggregated, and keep everyone on board. Last one. I personally I would love to see it more often. It's a retro and celebration phase where you just gather all the insights in how your pro process went so far and try to learn from it. What do we want to do better? How do we want to iterate on it for the next time? And the most important thing, it, it makes progress visible for the team, which helps them to go out this hamster wheel from time to time. And it can really be as easy as possible. Just have an hour for a scrum retro, have some drinks, have some snacks, have a good time with the team to build up more trust. In conclusion, it's really in the first phase all about a common understanding. In the second phase, it's about the opportunities and possible solutions to work on them together. And in the third phase, it's all about shipping new ideas, shipping new artifacts so that then can be monitored and iterated later on. And as a bonus, which you should, which I cannot stress out enough, you should really should do the retro and start to celebrate your progress because you did well so far. You delivered. And as a theme around all of this, it's really easy to keep it simple because complexity can kill processes. We, try, we tend to be as human beings to be overwhelmed by too much new things, too much complexity, and really try to involve your whole team. So everyone who is critical for the specific project. And you should communicate as often as possible and be as transparent as possible with your processes and with your progress. And what's really important when you change something, when you change processes, the first round will be hard, will be the hardest. It will be probably catastrophic, but you learn out of it and you get better and more speed over time. No worries. Small disclaimer at the end, change is always hard. Our brain likes easy, likes to get uh, as, as effective as possible. So if you do something, the brain gets used to it and don't want to change anymore. It is like it is. So if you want to change things, it's really hard. You need to be careful and you need to do it step by step by step. There's something like the boiling frog where you just start small and get bigger over time. I know that a lot of you probably know all these fancy design processes like IDEO, D-School, Double Diamond, and those are all great processes, but you should start small and then add more complexity over time which will help you and the whole team to just get used to this more flexible processes. And in some situations, pitching is a necessity. You need to pitch, but I personally, I try to avoid it whenever I can, to have more conversations instead. And last disclaimer, there's really no golden bullet. When you read something in the internet, in books, these are all things that works great for this specific use case. But your use case is probably unique. You are unique as a human being. So you need to have process that works for you and your individual circumstances. OK.
Okay, I felt I rushed uh, through the whole presentation without uh, checking the clock. You did. It was it was great. Thank you so much, David. So uh, so now it's time for questions. And while you guys type, hey, yeah, let's just give perfect. Let's give uh, David a big round of applause. Applause. Just uh, throw as many emoticons as you can against them. Perfect. I love it. All right. So uh, thanks a lot. It looks like you did good. So uh, while you're typing your questions, I'll just uh, I'll just start. So so David, of course, you know you um, you work as a a process consultant as well, right? So um, I'm I, I just got um, I mean, I, I'm in a different place right now. You know I've I've, I've implemented process as well, but what I really like now in, in this startup setting is that uh, collaboration is, is is quite easy when you don't have process, right? And 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 you know collaboration just just magically happens when you're a few people. So it's like, what, what's mm -hmm. your um, what's your advice to those you know just starting from scratch? I mean, do you need a a process to collaborate? At least uh, it's like with every good game, you need to have rules. You need to have rules, and you need to have the people need to know what to do in the end. Yeah. So if there are no rules, there are no game. Mm. That's everything. But it's really important that you don't overdo it with the rules. Have a simple process, have a simple communication flow running, and that's everything, especially for smart small startups. Okay. So, okay, while we're waiting for, for questions, I'll, I'll just uh, continue with my, my next uh, uh, question here. So, you know, collaboration, you know, that implies working together, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess you know, that also implies having something to work together on or collaborate on. Um, you know, so, so, so who is it that should collaborate and, and, and what should you, uh, what should you collaborate on? What's, what's like the artifact that you create together? Could you just give an example of, of who does this collaboration? Oh, that's a good one. I personally see it, um, I kind of like the metaphor of design thinking as an iceberg and everyone who participate in such a session will bring more input to the table so that you will be able to see the whole iceberg in the end. So especially in design, when you start with your concepts, everyone has an opinion and everyone could be a possible gatekeeper. So if you have everyone in one room to just discuss about it, you will reduce a lot of friction for the long run. But, and, and who is everybody? Is that is that the CEO as well or this the is, guys from marketing? Idiot. <laughs> right. Ideally, it is, but in most cases, it's a core team, which are designers, POs, PMs, developer, and also, if you are lucky, enough, a customer service, which can provide more inputs. And it's also nice if you have at least one person from higher management or C-level who can make decisions to ease up the process even more. Okay. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's the product team, like the product trio and the extended, uh, yeah. It's an important part of the whole product have, team. Have you any experience time. in, oh, sorry? It's a whole product team the whole time. I've had a lot yeah. of discussions when to start to bring the developers in, when to start to bring the researchers in and so on. And to be honest, information is important and we all need to have a shared understanding about all this information all the time. But I guess, you know, if you can handle it within your product team, you don't need to pitch, <laughs> right? Then if you're autonomous already, then there's no reason. That's the point. But like, what, what do you do then if you want, you know, you want to persuade or convince other people outside your product organization that what you're doing is the right thing or would ask permission like what what do you what do you say to them like how, how do you how do you handle that <laughs> that's a good question and i still come back to the pitch thingy and start off a conversation around it one thing mm -hmm. we did for example in the last two years with you exactly with our product kickoffs we started to get rid of the pitching instead we just set up a mural and have to have a conversation with the client to see what he needs and how we could help him, hmm. which works way better for us. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. And any last remarks? Any any last remarks, David? No, not from my side. All right. So thank you so much, and thank you for preparing this. Uh, without presentation, all that is left is communication. Love that. Love that. Perfect. 
Um, thank you so much. So, uh, so last, uh, year, uh, uh, but not least, I guess is, uh, is Tom, uh, Tom Griever, and I'm just trying to take over your presentation so you can take over mine. Tom wrote the mm -hmm. book articulating design decisions. So if you, if you, uh, love what Tom has to say in, in, in a few seconds, I suggest that you go in and, and, and buy the book on Amazon straight away. Uh, so we can uh, hit uh, the next mark and, and just be uh, you know on top of the Amazon bestseller list for just uh, one day more. Uh, so please, please help him out. I think this is a, a worthy read uh, by far. So uh, so Tom, uh, I'm super excited to have you, and you're gonna have this um, this topic of solving the whole cube. So I, I guess thinking, uh, getting outside your your little sphere of. Uh, of, of the product team, I guess. I'm not sure. I, I'm super excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, welcome, Paul, uh, Tom, and uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I mean, hopefully, given the, the kind of the theme uh, today, we'll, we'll kind of bring it all home and tie it all together for everyone. Um, you guys can see my screen, hear me okay, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so early in my career, um, I noticed that there was a designer on my team that seemed to have, uh, you know, more success getting their designs approved than another, um, and yet they both seemed to bring a similar level of like design skill to to the table. So I had two people that seemed to have an equal ability to create the right design solution, but they had very different experiences in their day to day jobs. And so, because I was in a leadership role. I wanted to help them be successful. And I really tried to work hard to kind of understand like why this was happening. Um, what I found was that one of them was just better at presenting their work. They were very articulate and the other one just wasn't nearly as much. Um, and so that one experience kind of led me on a journey my whole career to try to kind of understand this problem and evaluate it, maybe even systematize how we articulate design decisions to the other people in our organization so that we can be successful at del delivering both the best uh, user experience for our users or our customers, as well as the, the stakeholders uh, in our business. So in fact, I would actually go so far as to say that our ability to be thoughtful um, and articulate uh, our solution to a problem is more important than our ability to create the perfect solution. Because the truth is you can have the most innovative product or solution or idea in, in the world, but if you can't effectively communicate it to the people who actually hold the keys to your success, then it's it's going to see the light of day, right? They'll never even have that opportunity to, to help the people that we're, whose lives we're trying to improve, our, our customers, right? So today, I just want to connect all these dots for you and share several stories from my own career that I think will demonstrate how articulating design decisions can make you more successful as a product leader, designer, developer, really any kind of role in the, in the product development process. Um, so James worked for me several years ago. He was a uh, young, enthusiastic designer helping us build a brand new platform for a nonprofit, non-government organization to, to further a mission that would help people in his community. Now, his ideas were really innovative. He had this awesome user-centered design approach that taught him to always put the user first. Um, but he was also pretty arrogant, right? He always believed his ideas were the best. So when executives would raise questions or even provide criticism for his work, he became defensive, right? All oh, the stakeholders don't understand. He, would, he thought, uh, you're not the user, he would tell them. Um, and there was this one memorable uh, instance when someone raised a concern about a part of the product that was confusing or difficult to use. And he actually told them that the problem was that they were just too old and they didn't understand modern design patterns, whereas like our target customers would get it. So because James didn't address their concerns, right, they heard his rationale as just excuses, maybe even insults, right, to their person or character. Now, in the end, um, funding for that project was cut and James lost his job. So James had really good intentions. He was a great designer. He had empathy for his users, but he had like zero empathy for the people who actually held the keys to his success. He didn't understand the people he was working with. He lost their support. And as a result, the product he was working on never even had an opportunity to fulfill that mission that he believed strongly in, right? He was actually ever never able to help the people in the community that he cared about. 
So after he was let go, I had to kind of take over what was left of his project and where the organization decided we were going to take it. And I was trying to address people's concerns, but I was actually able to get more buy-in and support for that project just by managing the conversation differently, right? Even though I was technically producing less content than James had in his full-time role. Now, it's a really unfortunate story, I know, but I think it demonstrates what is a key missing ingredient for a lot of us, just the ability to empathize with the needs and expectations of our stakeholders. So if we expect to communicate with them, then we've got to use the same skills that we use in identifying with our users and our customers, right? Developing empathy, is, it's going to drive us to act, right? To frame our work, to position it to them in a way that actually complements those stakeholder needs in addition to the needs of our users or our customers. Um, so actually, I think that like successful product design leadership inside uh, any organization is really just about two things, communication and visibility. Our, our job is as much about making sure everyone is on the same page as it is about delivering a specific set of outcomes. Because if you're doing a good job of keeping everyone in the loop, then the details of exactly what you deliver become less important because everyone understands what you're doing and why. So. Uh, a few years ago, I was working on a product for a large uh, retail store in the United States. And our, our team was one of maybe six or seven that this department was responsible for. And there was an upcoming meeting with the CEO and other executives to kind of present our plan for the upcoming year. So two weeks before this meeting, the vice president of our division had us all start preparing what we would present to the CEO. We all made travel plans to go to San Francisco for several days. And for two weeks, I worked on refining our designs and creating slides and talking points, discussing and practicing our presentation with other people on the team. And then a few days before the meeting, we had a four hour call with this vice president who had each of us practice our presentation. And then he gave us feedback and guidance on what we should emphasize, which parts to remove. So what, what's funny about that though, is that like virtually none of his feedback was on the designs or like the specifics of the solutions that we were proposing. Instead, it was nearly all about how we talked about it and the words that we used or didn't and what he thought was going to be more appealing to that CEO. So when it came time for that meeting, I spent a whole day traveling to San Francisco. I was three nights in a hotel, a whole day in a conference room. And that was just me. And you, you multiply that by you know, a dozen other people in the room and you add up all the hours that we spent preparing and practicing and traveling. And then you add in our salaries, like this one meeting, the cost of that one meeting was not trivial. Those are hours we could have spent making our design better, right? We, we could have done more research or started on the next thing or addressed design debt. But no, exactly what we delivered was less significant compared to the effort of making sure that all of the executives in the company understood what we were doing. And in fact, at one point during that four hour call we were practicing, the VP said this, this is a direct quote from him. He said, all that matters is that Jamie understands what we're doing. He's not gonna care about the design. And yet the actual stated purpose of the meeting on the calendar invite was to review all of our design work. So one of the more significant realizations that I've had is this idea that we're not really seeking approval of our work in these meetings, but we're actually preparing our stakeholders for their own meetings. Let me give you two good examples. Um, in one of my first jobs as a designer, I had a manager who reported to another executive. My manager would take our design work and then share it with this executive every week or so in a room with other managers from sales and marketing and customer service. But the pattern I noticed was almost always the same. My manager would come back to our desks, um, have all these changes for us. We would make those changes and then the cycle would start all over again. But in the process, it just, I felt like much of my well thought out reasons or effort was kind of being thrown out. And I, I don't think that I was holding on too tightly to my choices, but I did have good reasons for why I did what I did. And, and it just seemed like those reasons were never really respected in the process. So I shared this with my manager who suggested that I come to that next meeting um, myself. What I discovered was that this meeting was just a free for all where like anyone with a pair of eyes and an opinion was just 
telling me how to do my job, right? Now, since I was there this time, I was able to explain what, you know, why I did what I did, and a lot of those opinions kind of faded in the process. Now, you could make the argument that my manager failed by allowing a meeting like that to inform our design process. Okay, that's true. But what I learned from that experience was that if I could actually give my manager the right vocabulary and understanding about my design, then she was much more likely to go into that meeting and represent my work as if it was her own, but in, in a way that fostered agreement with everyone else. And if she didn't have the confidence that she really understood my choices, then she was apt to just give in to anything that came her way. That's the first story. The second one is that on a different project, I was a consultant and my client was the director of engineering and we were creating an internal facing tool for his team to use that monitored the status of their servers or something. So he was an engineer and so he didn't have any experience working with a product and design team. So I was really upfront about our process. You know, we were going to start, you know, understanding the business cases and creating, you know, user flows. We would eventually transition that thinking into, you know, wireframes and mockups and higher fidelity designs. So he agreed in writing to this process. But then every week, it was like he was complaining that we weren't getting enough done, right? Where were the designs, he would ask, right? I would remind him of the process. He would, oh, yeah, that's right. He would agree, and we would move on. But about a month in, he got really upset. And in one meeting with me, he said, you guys have been working for a month, and you haven't done anything. I couldn't believe it. I mean, he, he had been in every daily stand-up. He had approved every user flow, he provided feedback, right? Where are the designs, he would ask. Now, he knew exactly what we were working on. I tried to remind him of that process, but it was like he had reached his limit and he wasn't gonna have any more of it. From his perspective, he had hired our company to create designs for this application and we weren't delivering. And at one point in kind of the heat of that conversation, he said, every week when I go to my senior leadership meeting, I have to show progress. And every week you give me nothing to show. Okay, there it was, right? Now it wasn't actually true. We, we actually always gave him something to show, but it revealed that he wasn't confident in his ability to understand and present something like a user flow or our research. We hadn't done a good job of giving him what he needed to represent our work to someone else. Now, did he actually care about our design work? Maybe. But I think he might have cared more about looking good to his peers and his bosses in a weekly meeting that, that we weren't even invited to, right? So once I realized that his goal wasn't always about designing the app, but actually about showing progress to his bosses, right? His job to be done was showing that progress. It allowed us to shift those priorities so that every week we gave him something, some artifact that he could present as if it was his own work. And if we couldn't do that, then our project risk uh, getting cut. So I think oftentimes we need to give them the tools and vocabulary that they need to go represent our work to someone else. Because if we can give them the confidence to represent our work, if they really understand our thinking to talk to someone else about it, then I think they're likely to approve it just as a byproduct. Sometimes our, our thinking is backwards on this, right? We go in trying to get their approval, when really we need to go in there and give them the tools and the vocabulary they need to represent our work to someone else in the organization. So a lot of what we do is just about fostering agreement, right? On the solution, on a roadmap or a timeline or a budget, right? Our roles are as much about getting other people to say yes as anything else. And I think the quickest way to do that is for us to be willing to lead with a yes um, ourselves. You may be familiar with the idea of the yes and, which actually has its roots in improvisational comedy as an exercise where um, two actors are constantly riffing off of each other by always starting with the word yes. Now, why is this effective in improv? It's because what one actor brings to the other, the only way for that sketch to move in a positive direction is for them to say yes, right? If they say no, or if they respond with ambiguity or uncertainty, then the conversation is just gonna die right there on the stage, right? Uh, it doesn't tell that good story. Well, guess what? Our conversations with these stakeholders, they're also an improvisation, are they not? Right? We don't know what they're gonna say. We have no idea where that conversation is going. And so I think if we really expect 
for it to go to that positive place, to actually tell a good story, then we should also be willing to lead with the yes. Um, I had a mentor who used to say, you know, innovation rarely happens in a place where no uh, is the typical response. So um, once I was meeting with the CEO to review an upcoming product release, and he started getting really uh, picky about one, one UI element. He complained about how it worked and what he found confusing about it, uh, including giving us all kinds of advice about how to improve it. And I responded by saying, yes i completely agree that we need to solve for that and something about that simple response i validated his perspective i expressed empathy with his position and i gave him the confidence that we would address it now i didn't even agree to make the changes he was suggesting i didn't agree to make any changes at all but that statement stopped him and he said great i know you guys will figure out the right thing to do and we moved on but leading with a yes seemed to have like reminded him that it was our job to think about those things, not his, that he could actually trust us with that solution. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me here, okay? So leading with a yes isn't about just doing anything and everything they say, but it is about leading the conversation literally with the word yes, actually using the word yes as the first word out of your mouth. And you can find dozens of ways of leading with a yes without actually agreeing to anything. Something like, yes, that's a really good point. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Yes, I'm really glad you brought that up because leading with a yes is all about reminding people about the areas where we do agree before we get to the parts where we don't agree. And when you lead with a yes, you make it so much more likely that that other person is gonna hear what you say and then respond with that same positive attitude. All right, last one. I am a list maker. I am a note taker. Love to write things down, to summarize my thoughts on a conversation, maybe to distill a really complicated idea down to just a few words. Um, but I usually do this just for my own benefit, okay? It helps by removing these things from my own cognitive load so that I can move on to the next thing. So it's self-preservation, right? If I can create a record of things and then refer back to them when a problem comes up, um, my notes serve as kind of that guide to track progress. Um, in fact, I'm the type of person that will add something that I've already finished to my to-do list just so I can cross it off and kind of see that progress. Now, I don't recommend any one particular tool or method for creating notes and documentation, but what I do know is that it has become a crucial part of how I communicate within uh, product teams. So I was uh, serving as a leader on a product team of about four or five people, uh, Mick a mix of uh, designers and developers. And we both reported to the director of UX on the design side, as well as the director of engineering on the technical side. And I was on this project for about 18 months inside one of the largest companies in the United States. And during that 18 months, the company had three major reorgs. So that means that the person I reported to on this project changed three times in just a year and a half. And every time our new boss would come in, look at our work, and ask the same obvious questions that the last one did, right? Why did we do it this way? Now, fortunately, I'd created a detailed set of notes from all of our weekly uh, design reviews and meetings with a brief explanation, not just of what we decided, but also why we made those choices. And in one particular case, I was able to go back three months in my notes to find the meeting where we made a decision in order to help our new leaders understand why we were here right now. In another role at a, at a different company, I was leading two different product teams. And I noticed that I was involved in several daily standups and weekly calls and demos to review my team's work. And it just felt like I was repeating myself to different sets of people. Um, I was also completely overbooked with back-to-back -back meetings and they just seemed to kind of generate the same questions. It didn't really feel like I had the agency to just not attend those meetings or to cancel them. So instead, I started recording a weekly video that was about 10 minutes long, a little bit less. And in this video, I would share my screen, kind of like I'm doing now, and I would review all of my work that my teams were delivering. Now, it was super quick and dirty. There was no editing. Um, but beforehand, I would write up a brief outline just to kind of guide my thoughts. I would open up all the, the browser tabs in, in one window in the correct order so I could just click from one tab to the other and just record this video really quickly. And then I would take that video and post it in the general channel in Slack where everyone in the company could see it. Now, that simple, like 10 minute weekly exercise just completely changed the meetings. 
what used to feel like hours of the same conversations turned into more like status updates. It allowed us to focus on the next things that were coming instead of the current things we were working on. All of a sudden, people from different parts of the organization now had confidence in what my team was doing without even the need to speak into our process or tell us what they thought. And then a month later, our CEO asked all of the VPs to start doing the same thing. And so now every VP from every business unit was posting these like five or 10 minute videos in that same Slack channel. So we had visibility into all the team's work. So I think like creating that accessible place where anyone in the organization has visibility into what I'm doing has always had benefits. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like people tend to fear what they don't know. They may assume the worst about something that they don't understand, but when you open up your process and your thinking to the people involved, when you give them access to look into that themselves, then suddenly people from all over will have a lot more confidence in you and in your team. So I share all these stories with you because as product and design leaders, I think we tend to focus on the deliverables that we create. I think sometimes we have an over-focus on that. We, we think those assets, that stuff, whether it's a Gantt chart or a roadmap or a user flow or a wireframe, we believe those are the things that add value to our organizations. And yes, those are definitely part of our role, okay? But our real job, our real job is this, okay? Our real job is to take all the parts and pieces, the things that we see, and then connect them in a way that is gonna make sense to the other people in our organization. So I frequently liken this to solving a Rubik's cube because uh, what's going to happen is someone's going to come in and say, hey, I like red. I want my side to be red. If you just turn this here, then my side will be red and I'm good. And our job is to be attuned to all the, the connections and the parts and the pieces in our product so that we can say, yes, I love red too. I also want your side to be red, but when I turn this here, it affects the other sides and I've got to solve for the whole cube. Because if you do that and you can get their support, then you'll be more successful. Because without that support, then we don't really have a job at all, right? And I think if you begin to see your primary role as one of a facilitator for other people, a role where you become kind of that connective tissue between all the different parts of the organization, then hopefully it will help you remember this idea that our stakeholders are people too, right? That our, the job really is as much or more about communication. Anything we can do to help our leaders represent our work is going to benefit us as well. Um, leading with a yes is going to help us build that forward momentum that's so critical. And that when we show people our process, when we give them that window into our teams and our, our ways of working, that it gives them the confidence um, in us and our team. Um, thank you again for attending today. I, my name is Tom. I've been designing software for over 20 years at big companies and small startups. And I consider these to be really crucial skills in our roles as uh, designers and, and leaders. And I, I love talking about it. Um, as has been mentioned, I wrote a book called Articulating Design Decisions about this, this very thing. Um, I do think we're going to take a few minutes to answer questions and wrap up here so we can continue the discussion about how we communicate with our stakeholders, keep our sanity, and still deliver the best user experience. But Anders, if you'd like to help lead the, the discussion here now, I'll hand it back to you. And now the mic is on. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. I was just like ecstatic and yeah. I really love how everything came together with the with the whole Rubik's cube. I was cube. I was like, what is this about? But it totally makes sense. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions, and I'm just going to ask David. Can you uh, can you ask your question to Tom? Yeah, sure. I just uh, was wondering when to do document what. As you all know, uh, conference gets kind of messy from time to time. Hashtag uh, black hole conference. Yeah. Yeah, I, so I, I do think that there is a certain amount of kind of skill and talent that comes with um, understanding what to document and what not to. And it, and it take, I think it takes practice, right? The way that I like to help people make that choice, though, is that you have to remember the purpose of your documentation is to help the future state of you and your team, right? So imagine you or your team three months from now would you be able to look back on that documentation 
and understand the kinds of decisions that you made and why you made. That's really the only purpose. And everything else can kind of fall off. Um, and there are maybe other things that you didn't include that you should include. But if you're able to put yourself in that state, look back on your notes and go, okay, I think I have, I have a good sense of why we made this decision and it will help us make decisions going forward. That's like the level of fidelity that, that I think you need. But I, I find that most people tend to focus on what we decided and they, they leave off why we decided it. And, mm -hmm. and the why, there can be all kinds of reasons why. Maybe, yeah, maybe, it's, maybe it's data, uh, maybe it was someone's opinion. Often it's just the, the, the person that was in the room, right? I'm, I'm surprised at how often it's helpful to write down the name of the person who was involved in that decision. Not because we want to blame them or point fingers, but just for accountability's sake, we need to be able to go back and, and look at these decisions and understand the context in which we made it at the time. Does that lead to like decision fatigue or, or, or just like not wanting to make a decision, you know, when your name is out there in the public? It's a good point. I hope that I hope that we have the opportunity to build trust with our teams, right? So that there is kind of like a safe place that people understand that um, the the desired use of that. And I think if I were concerned about that, I would want to have an open conversation with the team mm -hmm. about the, the 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 use the use cases mm -hmm. there. At the same time, I have to say if if someone isn't willing to put their name onto a decision, then I, I, it begs the question whether or not this is just their opinion and their subjective I, I, mm. idea or or not, right? So, like, I think there's kind mm. of two sides to that. Yeah. All right. So we've got uh, Prosina Kahlo. Can you uh, state your question? If you are still with us. I, I can see the question in, in there. The question yeah. is, uh, did they really watch it? Um, yeah. So... Right, so I, I totally get where you're coming from. Um, so one of the, I actually think one of the benefits of creating short videos like that is that it forces people to wait and watch them when they actually have the capacity to sit down and kind of understand what you're saying. A lot of problems uh, come up if you just send a Slack message and a screenshot of your design to some person who's standing in line at the airport waiting to get on a flight and they just have a knee jerk reaction and are like, you know, no, this is terrible, start over, right? Um, mm -hmm. But if you send them that five minute video and they're in that same situation, they're gonna wait until they can actually sit and watch that video and hopefully have a more informed response. Now, mm -hmm. does that take more time and mental capacity from them? Yeah, it does. There, there's no doubt there's a cost to that and you mm -hmm. have to weigh the cost benefit. Um, but I, I do find it to be advantageous that they might respond and say, okay, I'll watch that later. So if it's something that's truly urgent, I might actually try to, to get with them even just for five minutes or, or send them, you know, a, a, a DM if that's not actually going to work. The example I was giving was a, a, was a, a weekly video. So people typically had several days, if not a whole week to watch mm -hmm. and catch up and see where our team was. So there, there wasn't like a time, kind of like a time frame there. So, so uh, you know, I love your point about showing your work in, 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 in the video, just like everybody else, I think, you know, but opening up um, like that, um, I just remember having, especially junior designers on my team, um, you know, just first starting out and, and actually not just toward me as a manager, wanting to open up the work until they were done because they're, you know, uh, felt like an imposter or something or you know they're, they're they're just in the process and i think this is something that you you know you build up um over a longer period of time you know that it's about failing and it's okay otherwise you know rather catch uh, the errors while we're making them rather than you know you having spent two two weeks um but can you relate to that I mean, is it hard to get people to open up like that and just show it off to everybody else what kind of challenges? It, it is hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it's definitely hard. And I, I mean, even even more senior uh, designers on my team still struggle with that. I think you know people people hesitate to show a work in progress, right? Mm -hmm. um, they want to put the best foot forward. They want to present themselves as like they thought thought it through and had it together. And this idea of kind of showing a work in progress. Uh, it can be it can be a little bit terrifying for for some. So I I totally get it. Again, we go back to that like cost benefit, right? Um, sure, like I, the 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 main cost of sharing early and often is our ego, I think, mm. and our pride, 
Um, and I think if we're willing to set that aside a little bit more and provide the appropriate context for our work, right? I think if we're able to share the context of like, here's where I am in my process, right? Like I literally spent one hour throwing this wireframe together. So please don't have high expectations yeah. about like how much thought and effort was put in this, right? We have to let people know where we're at so that they can also self-select the kind of feedback they provide, right? Um, and that's an important part of the process too. Of course, we're not going to them you know, wireframes that we put no effort in as if it were a final product. Mm -hmm. And the environment is gonna dictate some of this too. You may work in an environment where people are expecting higher fidelity designs. Yeah. Now, I would say hopefully over time you can help influence and change that culture and that process, right? Cause you mm -hmm. do wanna get to a place where you can iterate more quickly, but maybe in the short term, you have to make that sacrifice of, you know, putting in more effort before you do show your work. But I. It's a constant struggle for me. Like as a, as a leader, I feel like one of my jobs is to constantly push my team and encourage them and tell them, no, you can show that. You should. Like we have this meeting. Please bring that right and tell them it's going to be okay and support them in that in that effort because a lot of people really hesitate. Yeah, and like, how do you lead by example as a manager? Uh, how, how do you like? What kind of uh, measures do you take? Like, what kind of? How do you expose yourself? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I love that because I do, I do try to do that myself. I, and I've had moments where you know we were kicking off a new, a new project or a new initiative, and rather than wait until I had the whole thing outlined and everybody lined up, I literally just like opened up a draft of my Google mm -hmm. Doc in a wide meeting with forty people from customer operations and sales, right? And I said, hey, you guys here's an idea I have. We're thinking about kicking off this project. We want your feedback. What do you think, right? Like, so I, I do try to demonstrate that and lead by example too, even with my own work. There's always stuff that we're doing that's mm. in process. And I hope that they, they, they see that and are encouraged by that too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, do you have any last remarks uh, before we, we, we continue or in? Oh, just thanks everyone for your time. It was so great to hear the, the different perspectives and hear your questions. I, I love that you guys spent the evening with us. Um, and if anyone has any questions for me that you didn't get to, feel free to look me up online and send me a message. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. I'm, as far as I know, I'm the only person uh, with my name. So uh, thanks again. Yeah, and just a, a quick recommendation once again. I, I, this is, uh, I think this is a game changer for, for how you see yourself as a designer. Uh, so I, I can really uh, recommend uh, reading Tom's book. So uh, if you enjoyed tonight, um, then I hope that you will join us uh, next time as well. So we are uh, switching between like PM, product management topics uh, and, and, and design here and there. Uh, the next um, is on prioritization. So how do you actually uh, make prioritization work, uh, not just with your own product organization, but how do you uh, rally your whole organization behind it? Casper um, and Clara are, are two mentors, uh, just like David is, uh, who, who spoke today. So if you like what they say, you can book him on Learning Loop as well. Um, and the next one is uh, is also quite interesting. Uh, and, uh, and and Tom, I, I guess you you know Thomas Glaser. He's one of the organizers of the PUSH conference, and he, he'll be talking about um, stepping boundaries uh, from design and product management uh, and, and start collaborating uh, across. And then we have Stephen as well, who has a, a large resume from Amazon, um, product board and so forth. So two exciting events. So mark those in your calendar and uh, be sure to, to join us uh, next time. Um, so uh, just want to have a, a last plug for, for the Learning Loop Mentor Platform. Uh, you can apply to become a member at learningloop.io. I will uh, I'll spend just a few minutes more uh, after this uh, looking at any applications coming in and be sure to to have you going if you are up for that. Uh, then there's nothing more to say than thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this. Uh, and thank you for sticking around, spending uh, two hours of your precious family time um, listening to all of us. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I hope that I'll see you again. Thank you so much, Tom, David, and, and Joachim, and everybody. Take care, guys. <laughs>